Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I know we're a small crew today. Half the church is away. Gone, had a wonderful wedding yesterday for a camp. But uh, it's good to be together and to praise God. So let's uh, stand and sing together. Start with Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, I am leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. I'm leaning, I am leaning. Leaning on the everlasting arms Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way Leaning on the everlasting arms Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day Leaning on the everlasting arms I'm leaning, I am leaning Safe and secure from all alarms I'm leaning, I am leaning Leaning on the everlasting arms What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, I am leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, I'm leaning, I am leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms, cause what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms I a blessedness What a peace is mine Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, I am leaning Safe and secure from all alarms Leaning, I am leaning Leaning on the everlasting arms I'm leaning I'm leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. I'm leaning, I am leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Heavenly Father, how we praise you. How we give you thanks, Lord, for the privilege of coming to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You're never um, too busy. We're able to come to you, Lord, and discover your mercy again and again in our lives. Even when we fail, even when we fall, you're there to pick us up. Such grace and such mercy, Lord. We are not worthy or deserving of it, but it is your great and deep and everlasting love that holds on to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for coming all the way and going all the way to the cross and you're all the way for us today, too. You sent your Holy Spirit to live in us so that we could worship you this morning and give you praise. We pray your blessing on the rest of the church that isn't here today. Bless them wherever they are, in the church and other places, as uh, the whole wedding party and all of that, what went on. We pray especially for Griffin and Kara this morning, Lord, that they will know a, a beginning of a wonderful life together as husband and wife. And we're thank so thankful, Father, for what you've done in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God, you have done great things. God, you give grace to the weak. 
bless the broken hearted with a song of praise to sing you reached down and lifted us up you came running and looking for us and now there's nothing and no one beyond your love you're the overflow you're the fountain of my heart so let your mercy reign let your mercy reign on us God, you have done great things. God, you give grace to the weak. And bless the broken hearted with the song of praise to sing. You reached down and lifted us up. You came around in and looking for us And now there's nothing And no one beyond your love You're the overflow You're the fountain of my heart let your mercy reign, let your mercy reign on us. You're the faithful one. When the world's falling apart, so let your mercy reign, let your mercy reign on us. deep how wide how long how high is your love is your love how deep how wide how long how high is your love your love oh God you're the overflow you're the fountain of my heart so let your mercy reign let your mercy reign on us You're the faithful one When the world's falling apart So let your mercy reign Let your mercy reign on us Amen Oh, we have a wonderful Savior today. You may be seated. A Savior who loves us so deeply and is willing to be for us what we cannot be ourselves. The amazing grace of God. Oh, 
see so clearly. Hallelujah, grace like rain falls down on me. They're washed away. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. such mercies the goodness of Be 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. And blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me. When the world's all as it should be, bless me your name. And blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, bless me your name. Sing you pour out I'll turn back to praise And when the darkness closes in Lord Still I will say Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Wow. Yeah, it's an awesome day. Oh, I see Bart Bunny coming. <laughs> well, hello there, Lammy. Hi, Bert. How are you today? Oh, pretty good. Yep, I'm uh, trying to be the best I can be. Oh, that's good. Well, you know, it's not easy to be good. No, that's true. It's easy to be bad. But, you know, one of the things that I decided I would do today is that I would not tell stories about anybody, not gossip, not even once. Well, Bert, that's a big improvement. You think you're going to be able to do it? Yes, for sure. I put my mind to it. And when you put your mind to it, you can do anything. Wow. Wow, you seem pretty sure. Oh, yes. Yep. Uh, you know, I'm not like that Henny Penny, you know, who's always saying things she shouldn't say. Did you hear what she said the other... Whoa, whoa, Bert. You just started gossiping right there. I did? Yeah. But I said I wouldn't do it anymore. Well, you just did. And I don't want to hear about it either, because it's not nice to talk about other people in a bad way. Oh, well, uh, I didn't really mean to. Okay, then. Now, from now on, I won't say anything bad about anyone ever, 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 ever again. Well, Bert, that's quite a statement. I hope you can do it. Oh, yes, when I put my mind to it. I know I heard that before. Yeah, well, this time it's for real. And, you know, um, uh, it's just wonderful to be a person who says something and keeps his word. Well, it sure is. You know, that's not like, you know, um, uh, uh, Quacky Lacky. You know what, you know what Quacky Lacky said? Whoa, Bart, you did it again. Uh-oh. 
I did. I did do it again. Oh no. I can't stop. How can I stop? Well, Bert, everybody has lots of struggles with things. Some people gossip. Some people are addicted to things. Some people are, you know, they get angry when they shouldn't. They're impatient. But you can't just stop by putting your mind to it. Well, what else can I do? Well, you can pray. And you can ask God to do it for you because God wants to help us so that we don't say things we should, shouldn't say. And so that we uh, can find a way not to do things. But making promises, uh, we break them. You know, I've broken a lot of those. But that sounds, seems to make a little bit of sense. So you're telling me that I can't just say I'm not going to do something. I have to trust God to be able not to do something. That's it. That's it, Bert. You got it. I have to learn that almost every single day. Wow. Well, that gives me some hope because I was feeling pretty hopeless when I said I would not, 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 and I did, did, did. Yeah, that's true. Well, um, anyway, let's see if we can get through the rest of the day and not say something bad. Okay, from now on, oh, oh never mind that. Uh, I'm going to just keep praying and asking God to make me so that I don't do those things. That's the way to go. That's what God can do. He can change us and change us for the better. Well, this is awesome. What are you doing now? I'm going down to see Millie. Oh, can I go down with you? Yep. <coughs> well, um, did you hear? Whoa, oh, oh, oh. God help me. <laughs> yeah, that's better. That's better. Keep talking to the Lord. Bert, you're going to have to pray to him every second. You know, that's what sometimes we need to do. Well, let's get down to Millie's and we'll get some fresh milk. Oh, that sounds good. We need God every day, every hour. Well, we're going to sing one more song, and then children can go upstairs. They want to. Christ is mine forevermore. We sang this last week, and it, uh, it's a great song, so we'll try it again today. Christ is mine forevermore. Mine are days that God has numbered I was made to walk with Him Yet I look for worldly treasure And forsake the King of Kings Mine is hope in my Redeemer Though I fall, His love is sure for Christ has paid for every failing, I am His forevermore. 
mine are tears in times of sorrow darkness not yet understood through the valley i must travel where i see no earthly good but mine is peace that flows from heaven and the strength in times of need i know my pain will not be wasted christ completes his work in me mine are days here as a stranger pilgrim on the narrow way one with christ i will encounter harm and hatred for his name mine is armor for this battle strong enough to last the war and he has said he will deliver safely to the golden shore mine are keys to zion city where beside the king i walk for there my heart has found its treasure christ is mine Continuing on in the uh, Gospel of John, and um, if you remember, we uh, looked at uh, Jesus washing the disciples' feet. This is the supreme creator of all things, and yet in love and in, uh, with a servant's heart gets down and washes the disciples' feet. And he says to them, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I give you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But that the scripture may be fulfilled, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that you, when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. He who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit. 
and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. So this morning, uh, we've already looked at the passage about ha having a servant's heart. But we come to this section of scripture, and we discover Jesus saying this in John 13, 21. He was troubled in spirit. He didn't take it lightly. He knew that there was a betrayer among them. There was from the very beginning. And, but it doesn't mean he took pleasure in it. It doesn't mean that he wasn't um, hurt about it. It doesn't mean that he didn't care for Judas. But he makes that announcement to the disciples and he says, I'm doing this that you might realize that this is who I am. I'm letting you know something. I'm, I'm, I'm opening a little window to show you that there is trouble, real trouble coming. And that real trouble is that one of you are going to betray me. And the disciples looked at one another and they were perplexed about whom he spoke. They didn't all say, ah, we know which one it is. They were troubled. And they were troubled to the point we find in Mark's gospel, chapter 14, verse 18, this is a similar passage in other gospels. Now as they sat and ate, Jesus said, Surely I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? They felt it. They felt the sorrow of someone betraying them and also the fear that could it be them? Could it be me, Lord? Could I do that? Is it I? Is it I? You can see what they said, you know, how they felt about it. He answered in Mark 14, 20 and said to them, it is one of the 12 who dips with me in the dish. So he's making it very clear. It's, it's one of these 12 that are right here. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Such strong words. So um, make a person to cause and try to figure out what would, we do? what would we do if we were one of the twelve? When you hear the kind of news that Jesus was giving there. And you know, in one sense, the disciples were humble enough to realize, maybe I could. Have you ever felt weak? Have you ever wondered what would happen if you were put in a compromising situation? Would you follow Jesus if the cost was high? Or would you fail him? And I think, in all honesty, the disciples felt that. And so do we. Because if you really stopped and thought about it for a few minutes, have you failed Jesus at least once since you accepted him into your life? Have you? Yeah. Well, if any of you say no, either you just got saved in this very second, or else uh, you're a liar, or you're self-deceived, So in John 13, 23, there was a, one leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. This would have been John. That's referred to John. He, he writes in the third person. And when it says leaning on his bosom, we have to understand how they sat down and ate. They didn't eat in chairs like we do. They uh, were on like divans, and there was a table in the middle, and they were all, they'd all be reclining at the table. That's how they ate. Like, and the next one would have been next to them, right around the table, around the table. And Simon Peter therefore motioned to him. He says, John, John, who's he talking about? Who, who it was whom he spoke. He says that he motioned to him. So he's trying to get John's attention. And he's saying, who is it? Do you know who it is? Mm -hmm. And in John 13, 25, then leaning on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? So John takes Peter's cue and he says, who is it, Lord? And Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I've dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Christ already knew. 
He already knew who Judas was, and he knew what Judas was going to do. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him, and Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. They didn't even catch on, because they thought... For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, buy the things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. That he was giving him a job to do. And having received the piece of bread, he went out immediately, and it was night. So we know that Judas went and for 30 pieces of silver sold out Christ. And we look at that, and, and uh, you know, I always have this, I don't know, I just feel so sad when I think of a person like Judas, a man who walked with Christ for three years, three and a half years, a man who saw and did and performed and was with the disciples. The other disciples had no idea that Judas was a betrayer, seemed like the rest of them, everything seemed kosher, whatever. But we know the real story about Judas because we have the picture that the scriptures give us about him. Very early in the ministry, Jesus said this, Did I not choose you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. It's not like Judas was a good penny, a good guy gone bad. He was bad from the beginning, and Jesus knew it. And it, with the wicked heart that he had, God raised him into that position of being one of the twelve because he was going to be betrayed. He had to be betrayed. It is not that God made him wicked. Judas chose to be wicked, but God placed him in the position with his wickedness to be the betrayer. It was a choice that Judas had made, not God, in terms of his conduct. And so we find that a little later on, as we already looked just recently in John 12, 4, one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, and this was when a woman had poured out a year's worth of ointment on Jesus, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. So Judas had made choices, wrong choices, long before he betrayed Jesus. His life was a life of thievery. He was a thief. He had a devil in him from the beginning. And yet he was trooping along with the rest of the apostles and disciples, and they didn't realize it. So that can happen. Someone can be in the Christian church and saying, yeah, they love Jesus, but their motives are completely wrong. And eventually that comes out. Yeah. Just one question. And I know the devil, the devil was in him. But then it says that Satan entered him and he threw that. That just, why was that? That Satan had to enter him when he was in him already? It said he had a demon. Yeah. Yeah. He, Judas had a demon, but now Satan himself entered. Oh, okay. okay. So there's the difference, right? So when you take certain steps of wickedness, more wickedness comes. You take more steps of wickedness, even more wickedness comes. And, uh, but let me tell you the contrast to that. Take steps towards the light and more light comes. So you know which way to go. Don't go towards the dark. Go towards the light. The, the price is too high. Now, you know, sometimes even... God's people can wonder, well, gee, I hope I don't end up like Judas. What about me? What about my failings? But let's have a look at another person here. Oh, well, first of all, let's look at what Jesus has to say about certain kinds of people. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 20, by your fruit, by their fruit, you'll know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So it's not just people who say they are believers, it's who live like believers. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? In other words, wow, these people seem to be like the flash and dash of Christianity. They're amazing. They're amazing. And he says, here's what he says. I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, man looks on the outward appearance and God looks on the heart. How many so-called TV evangelists have come and gone over the years? 
where everybody thought they were almost the Messiah. And then the next thing you find out, everything was filthy and rotten underneath. TV screens can be very deceiving, you know, they're just one dimensional. You don't see the whole person. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, he said, you've fully known my manner of life and my doctrine. That there's not a, there's not a difference between my ma manner of life and my teaching. If you practice lawlessness, he said, I never knew you. Depart from me. But I want to look again here and can give a little bit of a contrast because in Mark 14, 27, Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. So it wasn't just Judas who went the wrong way. In one sense, they all did. So what's the difference between Judas and, let's say, Peter? Because Peter kind of went pretty far down the hole, didn't he? Because listen to what happens here. All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. It's a quote from Zechariah about Christ being the shepherd, being struck, and the sheep will be scattered, the disciples all being scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Peter understood what Jesus was saying. He said, every one of you are going to stumble. And now Peter opens his, well, you could almost say his big mouth. Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Not me, Lord. Not I. Now, just before that, he was saying, Lord, is it I? But now, no, I will never. Jesus said to him, surely I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. What was Peter's answer to that? He spoke more vehemently. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And everyone else said the same thing. No way, Lord. Even in the face of Jesus telling him what was coming, Peter, you're going to fall. You're going to fall hard. Not me. I'm ready to die for you. In Luke 22, 31, Jesus said, said to Peter, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, I remember my mother sifting wheat. I, I, you don't see that anymore. Do they still do that? You know, you get flour. Sometimes. What's that? Sometimes. When they're baking, you, you sift it. To, well, why do you sift wheat? Get any impurities out of it kind of thing or whatever? To break it up so it gets smooth and fluffy, whatever. Is that, is that right? Yeah. She, is that right? She does it all the time. Yeah. Okay, so he, uh, Jesus says, Satan ha asked for you. He wants, to, he wants to sift you as wheat. He wants to control you. He wants to have you in his hands. But I prayed for you, Jesus said, that your faith should not fail. And when you've returned to me, strengthen your brothers. So here's Judas, who has a demon who's betraying Jesus. Here's Peter, who says, I'll never deny you, and yet he fails so miserably. And yet the Lord says, I'm praying for you that your faith won't fail. Now, if, if we thought about Peter three times denying the Lord and failing the Lord, like denying him, cursing and denying him three times, would you say that he failed him? Did his faith fail him? But Jesus said, I pray to you, your faith should not fail. How could he say it that way? After all that mess, what he's telling him is, Peter, you're going to fall, and you're going to fall hard, but I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to hold you. I'm going to keep you in the midst of your failures. I will be with you. So what's the difference then between Judas Iscariot and Peter? What's the difference? Well, Judas Iscariot, his motives were wrong from the beginning. He had no desire for Jesus. His desire was for wealth 
and likely fame. Um, he, he, he traded in Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, but he was already a thief long before that. He had a demon in him before that. He was a false uh, believer uh, consistently. And so that's, you know, Judas's credentials. You know, you say, well, he, he traded in Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Why did he throw the 30 pieces of silver back? Yes. I believe that he thought he could get 30 pieces of silver out of the bargain, and it would provoke Jesus, and then Jesus would stretch out his arms and rule and reign, and he'd, he'd even get more money. Like he'd be in, he'd have it made in the shade, in the shade so to speak. But all his plans fell apart, and Judas, in great depression, took his own life. Jesus said, better that the man had never been born. But that was his wicked heart from the very beginning. But what about Peter? What about Peter? I mean, he made promises. He said, I'll never forsake you. And yet, what did he do? He denied the Lord three times. Christ was being on trial, and Peter was warming himself by the fire. And they said, well, we know you. You're, you're the Galilean. We can tell who you are. We, you follow Jesus. No, he said, I don't know the man. I never knew the man. And then he cursed and said, I never knew the man. So why does he end up being one of the principal leaders in the church of God? Huh? Does that, does that make you feel qualified to be a leader in the church of God when you've gone this far, denying the very Lord? Three times, not just once. But Jesus told them that's what's going to happen. But he also said, I'll be praying for you. And when you've returned to me, strengthen your brothers. It's such a beautiful passage because what he's saying to him is, Peter, you're going to fall far. But I am going to hold you, even spoke know how far down you've gone. And I'm going to take your failure and I'm going to turn it into a blessing when you return to me, strengthen your brothers. You're going to know what it's like to be a failure, Peter, so that you will realize that you have no strength in yourself. And then you discover what real strength is, and then you can be a strength to others. So friends, wherever we are today, right now, maybe you failed the Lord. Maybe you failed him this week or this month or this hour, let me encourage you that that's not the end. Indeed, God can take those very failures and bring blessings out of them. He can cause all things to work together for good to those who love God. So don't mope around in discouragement, but rather take your licks, look to the Lord, Accept his forgiveness and know that you can return to him when you return to me, he said. When you've returned, you can come back, Peter. Well, how far can I go before I can't come back? God only knows that. But I can tell you it's a long way when you look at what Peter just did. You see, Peter didn't have a second agenda he just failed. And in that failure, the Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. But Jesus said, I am going to cause you not to go too far. And you're going to return to me. And then you're going to end up being someone who's a blessing to others. Have you not noticed sometimes that you can identify with people who've gone down and failed? You can come alongside of them and be more of a blessing to them if you've never. That's not saying go out and fail so that you can experience that. But God can take your failures and turn them into blessings. He can take the hole that you're in and lift you out of it and in turn enable you to be a blessing to others that they might be lifted out of the holes that they're in. Yeah, Peter said, Luke twenty two thirty three. 33, he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you'll deny me three times that you know me. 
Peter had lessons to learn, and so do we. And those lessons to learn are that we are weak, and that failure can come easy to us, and that in order for us to be able to walk and to walk in victory, there is no promise that you can make. Didn't Peter make some pretty bold promises? He certainly did. And, you know, he tried to fulfill them. If you remember, when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter had a sword. He pulled out the sword and he cut the ear off of Malchus, the high priest's servant. So he was, you know, he was kind of saying, I'm proving it now, Lord. Look what I'm doing. You know, and Jesus says, put away your sword, Peter. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Put that sword away. I'm sure he was confused. He took his best foot forward. He raised the sword. You know, he wasn't much of a warrior. He was a fisherman. He kind of made a miss there. He only got the guy's ear. And then Jesus picks up the ear and heals him. Lord, I did my best. I got his ear. Now I don't even have that. And then things just went downhill for Peter. And then when there was, Jesus was on trial and knowing what might happen to Jesus and what might happen to him, he began to deny him over and over. Three times he denied him. But the Lord was there. The Lord was there. And actually at one point in the scriptures, it tells us that Jesus looked over at him when the rooster crowed and he saw him and then he went out and wept bitterly. But later on, at the Sea of Galilee, after the resurrection of Jesus, Peter, uh, Jesus takes Peter aside and he says, Peter, do you love me? Three times. He says, if you love me, then serve others, really. Feed my sheep. If you serve others. So what are you going to do with the failures that you've had in your life? What are you going to do with them? Bring them to Jesus. Lay your life down before him. Have you walked away from God at times? Have you failed him miserably and terribly? You can still come back. And you can ask forgiveness. And God will take it and he will use it in your life. But there are things that we need to know. Otherwise, we will wonder, well, how could, this, how could I do this? How could I do this again? How could I fall again? Well, listen, here's what the Bible says about our hearts. The heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. The Lord knows. But know this, that in our flesh, here's what Paul writes in Romans 7, 18. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Have you discovered that yet? Or do you pat yourself on the back and say, I'm really good. You know, I'm like Peter. I won't deny you. I'm good. I'm solid. No, in your flesh, that is in your sinful nature, there is nothing good there. Nothing good dwells. And then he says, why? He says, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I don't find it. I can't live the Christian life, Paul says. He's writing as a Christian, and he says, I'm a failure. You know what? I stand here before you as a failure, and I'm glad I am. I'm glad I don't have the ability nor the power to live Christianity, and I don't. But I know someone who does, and his name is Jesus Christ. So my hope of living a Christian life any moment of any day depends upon Jesus Christ, not on me. And as I lean on Christ, I can live. As I lean on Christ, I can live. As I lean on him, I can step forward and walk the Christian walk. That's the only way. And so what I have discovered, I was sharing that with someone uh, just yesterday, is that the longer I'm a Christian, the weaker I am. And I'm glad to be weak. Because when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. It's when I think I'm good. When I think I can is when I fail. And so uh, before my feet hit the floor, I know, God, unless you're doing the living in me, unless I'm living in dependence upon you, I am going to fail because I can't do this. Nothing good dwells in my flesh.
However, Christ has come to live in me. The Spirit of God is upon me. And as I lean on him, he's able to live this Christianity out. So there's a big difference between Judas and Peter. And the difference is, is that Judas didn't have the Lord, didn't want the Lord. He had another agenda. So if we have another agenda altogether, then we're not, we don't really belong to the Lord. Because God changes our desires. And when he met Peter, he changed Peter's desire. Peter had a desire for Christ, but he couldn't fulfill it. But that's okay. None of us can. And when we realize that, that's where real freedom begins to happen. Paul expressed it in this way. For I know in me that in my flesh nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I do not find it. For I find... For the good that I want to do, I don't do. In other words, I'm determined to do the right thing, but I've found out I want to do good, but I can't do it. I don't do it. The evil I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. I practice evil even though I don't want to do it. Oh, what a frustration. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I that does it, but sin that dwells in me. Oh, what a tongue twister that is. If I'm doing what I don't want to do, he says, it's not me that's doing it, not the new me, but it's sin that dwells in me. I have this flesh, this sinful nature that wants to go in the wrong direction. Guess what? So do you. How do we overcome that power? Here's what Paul says, O wretched man that I am. He was miserable about it. He says, I really want to serve God. I want to do the right thing, but I end up doing the wrong. Who can deliver me from this body of death? That's what he describes it as. And he has an answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it, the mind, I myself serve the law of God with the flesh, the law of sin. So the new mind, the new nature, the new person that I become in Christ, I can serve God in this because it's Christ in me that's doing it. But if I'm living in the flesh, then the law of sin is there. And the law of sin says, I'm going to sin. I can't help but sin. Because there's nothing good there. I need Jesus. So that's the contrast I want to give to you today. Is that Judas Iscariot, yes, he denied the Lord. But some people think he lost his salvation. No, he never had it from the beginning. He never, he, never, he never had a wrong agenda. He didn't really serve or love or walk with Jesus. But when you, are as a Christian, find yourself in failure, you have a great lesson to learn from Peter, who will strengthen you by his experience that God restored his soul, raised him up, and used him for God's glory. So God can take us, who at times are wretched, who at times have failed. The wonder of God is whatever has happened in the past, I can come to Jesus now, ask him forgiveness for it, and know that I'm forgiven, and that Christ now can do the living in me again. Now that doesn't mean that God wants you to be constantly uh, sinning and then asking forgiveness, sinning and asking forgiveness. Because that gets old, doesn't it? It gets real old, real fast. It means that he wants us to go from strength to strength, from faith to faith, to victories. He wants us to grow and go in God. And so he wants us to realize, and this is so important to realize how weak we are, that we might truly depend upon a strong God. I can't, but Jesus can. I can't. That's a good way to start your day. I can't live today, but Jesus can. I dare not live today, so Jesus, I need you to live in me. Take over, Lord. Take over. And I can serve God this way. So then you have nothing to boast about. You have nothing to boast about to others. Oh, look at me. Look at me. No. No. Don't look at Jesus, right? When you stand before the Lord, you're not going to say, well, Lord, you know, you got a good fellow when you got me. You're not going to do that. 
You're going to know when you see Jesus face to face, it's God, it's only your mercy. It's only your grace that has brought me this far. It's it. That's it. It's Jesus. And that shows you something, friends. Jesus is not just the Savior that forgives you the moment that you're converted, but he's the ongoing Savior that you need every day to save you from yourself, from the power of Satan, from the influence of the world, from your sinful nature. Boy, you need Jesus. He's the only one. Only Jesus can do these things. Religious practices can't do it, no matter what religion it is. Self-determination won't do it. Jesus will. And I want to encourage you with these truths. Jesus will do it. He will do it. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He will. Jesus said you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Because that's what he has come to do. He's come to heal broken hearts. He's come to set captives free. He didn't just come for you to make an empty profession. He came for you to know him and to discover Christ is your life. And it was, it's written well in the word of God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then we shall appear with him in glory. When Christ who is our life. Your only hope is Jesus. It will always be Jesus because he's the good shepherd. What does it say in Psalm 23? He restores my soul. Yeah. Thank God for that. Praise the Lord that it isn't what you're going to do for God that's going to give you some kind of brownie points with the Lord. It's what God will do for you. And when we get our eyes off ourselves and on Christ, then we begin to understand what an awesome Savior he is. Then even though it may be years since you've been converted, Yet Christ becomes even all the more precious every moment because it's not just the day that you were converted, but it is every day I need Jesus. And every day Jesus is here. Every moment Christ is our life. Praise his name. I love this passage in Isaiah 40, 11. I'll close with it. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom. <coughs> Excuse me, and gently lead those that are with young. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. God gives this picture of who Jesus really is. So don't be frustrated with the Lord when you fail. Realize it's my fault. If I failed, it's my fault. And God is right there, ready to forgive, restore, and let all your life, your hope, any way that you're going to live this Christian life, it'll have to be Jesus. It has to be a relationship. Not religion, but a relationship with Jesus Christ is your only hope. But praise God, it's a sure and a certain hope, and it's sure and certain right in this very moment. Live in this moment. Rejoice in this moment that Christ is your life. Christ is your victory. And trust him for the next moment. And watch God work. Amen. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for its, the word of God. Thank you, Lord, that, Lord, you do look after your own. That you said you lose none of your sheep. And that you will keep us, O oh God, and protect us. O oh Lord. O oh Father. Have mercy on all of us. To get through this day, we acknowledge we need Jesus. Whether it looks like an easy day or a hard day, we have no idea what's coming. 
But we thank you that Christ is always enough for all of it. And we give you praise in his name. Amen. 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 And bless our food and fellowship. Amen. Please stay for lunch. <laughs>